And good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar, Taking Charge of Your Moods. My name is Brian Thompson with Candu Multiple Sclerosis. Uh, this webinar series is brought to you by Candu MS, the National MS Society, and the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada. For those of you who are new to Candu MS, we deliver health and wellness education programs to help families with MS thrive. Please visit the Candu MS website, candu-ms.org, to learn more about our online and in-person programs. The mission of the National MS Society is to help people affected by MS live their best lives as they stop MS in its tracks, restore what has been lost, and end MS forever. You can explore other society programs, services, resources, and connection opportunities at nationalmssociety.org. We hope that tonight will be uh, an interactive discussion on a, on a very important topic. Uh, so we're gonna leave about 20 minutes at the end of the presentation for question and answer. Um, so we certainly encourage you to submit questions and we'll try to get to as many as possible uh, at the end of the presentation. You'll see a question and answer chat box uh, found in your control panel on the left side of your screen. Um, just so you know, the presentation is being recorded and will be archived on both the Can Do MS and National Society websites. Uh, so if you miss something, you can always go back and look at the archive version. Uh, you'll also see uh, an attachment with a PDF copy of tonight's slides uh, so you can follow along. Um, if you're calling in, your, your phone lines are being muted and the only way to submit questions is, is online uh, through the chat box. Um, the archive versions will be uh, sent in a follow-up email that you will all receive by the end of the day tomorrow. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our two speakers. Uh, we have Stephanie Nolan, an occupational therapist, and Megan Beyer, a psychologist. And they're gonna be discussing different ways to uh, use man behavioral intervention and environmental and lifestyle changes to, to take charge of our moods. Just as a disclaimer, uh, we're not really gonna discuss anything involving medications or treatments. We certainly encourage you to discuss that with your healthcare team, but we're really gonna stay away from medications and talk more about uh, management techniques and behavioral interventions. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over uh, to our speakers and let them introduce themselves and talk about uh, their role in managing moods. So we're gonna start with Stephanie Nolan. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi. My name is Stephanie. I am an occupational therapist. Um, I have been uh, with Can Do for about four years, and um, I just have a passion for helping people with MS and other neurological disorders. Um, so it's kind of how I got into Can Do and why I'm here today. And um, it might kind of seem a little strange having an OT in on this conversation, um, wondering how it fits in. So I'll tell you a little bit of why I'm here today. So the OT does have a good role when it comes to managing moods um, because we do help identify physical and vis visual barriers to daily activities. And um, we can also help develop ways to manage fatigue. We can help modify the environment or for optimal performance. We can adapt activities, especially those meaningful activities that are important to you. We can identify tools that you can use to improve your participation. We encourage communication and social support throughout your community and with your friends and family. We can help identify the strengths that you have because people tend to notice their weaknesses and sometimes it's good to have someone to point out your strengths that you can use to improve your participation in meaningful activities. And we can help educate you and your support partners and your family and your friends on understanding MS and how we can help improve your function. So Megan, I'll have you introduce yourself. Thanks. So my name is Megan Beyer. I'm a psychologist at uh, Johns Hopkins. Um, I started work in MS in my graduate program um, back in uh, 2007 and I've been working in multiple sclerosis ever since. Um, and I'm really excited to be here and part of this webinar and um, part of the uh, Can Do team. Uh, so I think I'm also really excited to have uh, Stephanie as, as part of this uh, webinar. Uh, I actually didn't realize how much occupational therapists could do to manage mood until I came to Johns Hopkins and we have an entire um, team of psych OTs um, who specialize in this. And so it's really exciting that she's here. And I think OT um, adds a really um, important perspective to how to manage moods. So what does a psychologist do? 
Uh, I like to tell my patients that uh, we don't make you lay on a couch and tell us all your deepest, darkest secrets. We're really here to partner with you and help problem solve how to get through difficult emotional times. So um, we assess and treat emotional distress. We help you identify the difference between normal emotional reactions, so things like frustration, grief, anger, um, versus persistent and unhelpful moods like uh, depression or panic disorder. We help you understand the source of your unwanted emotions, and we teach you strategies for how to manage those difficult life events um, things like being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis or living with a chronic medical condition um, that has uh, a lot of uncertainty attached to it. So we um, work with you to uh, learn how to manage those difficult emotions. So some of our learning objectives for tonight are to learn about adjustment to those emotions, depression and anxiety. Uh, for people living with MS and their support partners, not just those with MS, because together you go through a lot of emotions. Um, we're going to learn how OT and psych can work together to help you with your mood management, which we kind of touched upon already. And we're going to discover some strategies to help you manage those emotions. Um, you know, we're going to go through some practice activities. We're going to talk about some scenarios. We're going to bring all these things together and help you find ways that you can improve your mood at home or help to manage it as best you can. Okay. So I just like this image, uh, mindful or mindful, right? <laughs> so it kind of uh, gives a little bit of a perspective uh, in terms of where your mind is um, and maybe what our, our goal is um, in managing adjustment emotions. And adjustment emotions are normal reactions to difficult life event, events. And those I mentioned a little bit earlier, I'm sure many of you have experienced things like grief, frustration, anger. I'm going to give two um, specific ex examples, um, and these are um, quotes from people with multiple sclerosis Who've, who've written about their experience with these emotions. So the first is um, from Ashley, who was diagnosed with relapsing remitting MS in August of 2010 at the age of 22. She talks a little bit about grief and she said, it's hard to explain why I felt grief because I didn't lose anything, I didn't lose anyone. But in a way, I felt like I was losing who I once was. And in a way it's true. I couldn't just ignore my MS and pretend that I was the same person before I was diagnosed because that would be a lie. So I had some grief for the for losing the person that I once was. Um, and I'm sure that many of you who are listening to this can really relate to what Ashley is saying. I know I've heard it many, many times in um, the people that I've worked with. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how to manage those emotions of grief when they come along. Um, the next emotion is frustration. I think this is something we've all experienced, especially if you have something like multiple sclerosis. Um, and this was written by um, Travis Gleason, who was diagnosed with secondary progressive MS in uh, 2001. Um, and uh, this is an excerpt from a blog post that he wrote. Uh, and he said, um, this isn't an all day, every day thing. It's more of a squall or a passing shower that brings with it a quality of hostile takeover or a silent scream. It's raging against a wall. It's frustrating. Yep, that's it. MS is frustrating. We all feel it, I believe, to some extent. No matter how Pollyannish we are or act, we sometimes just experience MS as the verb to prevent a, a plan or attempted action from progressing, succeeding, or being fulfilled. To cause someone to feel upset or annoyed as a result of being unable to change or achieve something. I do as much as I can when I can, and I employ whatever assistance I need to get those things done. Sometimes, like the storm cloud that comes out of nowhere, I also get frustrated by the things I cannot do or do well or well enough. And again, I think I've heard this same theme in many of the many of the people that I've um, worked with. And I think this is a completely normal reaction to the frustrations of living with multiple sclerosis. Finally, I want to mention one more thing um, about anger, and then we're going to touch on um, what to do with these emotions and how to manage them when they come up for you. Anger. 
um, is a masking emotion. And that's uh, the, what I mean by that is that many times anger masks the soft emotions that are uncomfortable for us to feel. Right. So if we feel grief, if we feel frustration, if we feel sadness, um, many times it's very uncomfortable to sit with those kinds of emotions. And so we react in anger because that's a safer emotion. And so when um, when we feel anger, a lot of times it's helpful to take a step back and um, try to look internally and see what is behind that emotion. What other emotions are you feeling in addition to anger? And one, just kind of taking a little bit of a peek into what to do with these emotions, one tip that I usually give people when they bring up anger and how to manage it is to uh, think about who in your life you would not lose your temper around. So would you lose your temper around your kid's teacher? Would you lose your temper around your grandmother? Would you lose your temper around a religious leader or your boss? Um, if there's somebody in your life that you wouldn't lose your temper around, we know that you can manage your your anger. And if you um, if you can kind of picture that person uh, sitting in the room with you when you want to when you feel yourself getting heated or or starting to feel irritable, that might help you um, manage that those emotions. So we made a little scenario to kind of go over. So we're going to talk about Larry. He's always been a very independent person, but recently he's been struggling with mobility during bathing, toileting, um, dressing, and other self-care tasks. He's not talked to his wife, Debbie, about this because he's embarrassed and doesn't want to lose his independence. Debbie has noticed that Larry has been more angry and frustrated with self-care, especially in the mornings during the morning coffee time. Larry's also been struggling with grief of his loss of independence. So we're talking about some of the challenges that Larry has here in the mornings and it's showing as anger, it's showing as frustration, it's showing as grief, all those, those feelings are coming out. Um, so here in this mental monologue here, I have, uh, Megan, will you jump in on that for me real quick? Yeah, of course. So um, I wanted to, you know, we all have different um, mental tapes that run through our mind regularly. And so in each of these different vignettes that we bring up, um, I've added a, mental tapes that run through all of our minds. And I think with Larry, what we're hearing is a lot of shoulds and musts. And when we have, when we say should to ourselves, or we say should about other people, we feel guilty about our own um, inadequacies or the fact that we are not doing that thing. So for example, I should be eating better. I should be exercising. If we say that to ourselves, we usually feel guilty and it doesn't usually help us in terms of um, improving that behavior that we want to be doing. And if we say somebody else should be doing something like that person should be driving better or that person should pay attention to me more, um, then we tend to feel resentment for that other person. So um, just start to pay attention to the should words going through your mind and notice what emotions those bring up for you. So going from the should, now what we can do, we're going to talk a little bit about how an OT can help with this mood management in this situation. So Larry had a home evaluation done, and they came through and did um, a full assessment of his house and his function and decided to add grab bars in the shower, a tub transfer bench, handheld shower head, um, a raised commode with handles, a chair to sit in while he's shaving, adapted equipment was suggested, including button hooks, adapted clothing, electric razors. All of these different adapted techniques and modifications were offered to Larry. And Larry, taking on this advice from his OT, was able to improve his morning routine. And he's learning that he's not as frustrated and angry because he's more independent. He's able to do the things that are important to him without having to ask his wife for help. Um, and in the same situation there, now his relationship with his wife, Debbie, is able to improve because now they can enjoy their morning coffee together and they're having their, their relationship come back together versus having to feel that frustration and anger in the morning. He's a little more relaxed with his independence now. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. I've heard this many times from some of my patients, but what do you, um, when, when somebody expresses 
you know, frustration of I, I don't want to have to use these things, you know, how do you usually approach that? So I do come across that a lot. A lot of people avoid things like a, a shower chair because it uh, it looks disabled. You know, you kind of get that feeling of, well, then then I'm giving up. Um, but and we'll talk a little more about the four P's later. But it's important to realize that these things are actually enabling you, not disabling you. They give you that independence. They give you more freedom. If you can manage your morning easier and you're not so fatigued by the end of your morning routine, you can enjoy so much more of life. And, and I think people do tend to be a little resistant to trying them. And once they do, it is a game changer for them. They realize how much it has made their life more enjoyable. All right. Okay, so um, one of the things that I like to do is use metaphors um, to try and help um, understand the concepts that um, I'm teaching um, with people that work with me. So one is this idea of the swamp. And I think this really fits well um, with these kinds of emotions that are normal reactions to um, living with a chronic medical condition like MS. So suppose you love mountain castles, right? So I, I visited a mountain castle on my honeymoon um, in Germany and um, they're just beautiful. And suppose you love mountain castles and you've been dreaming to visit this one particular castle um, for years and years and years. And you're finally within easy reach of that castle that you wanted to visit. Um, but when you get close, you discover that it's completely surrounded by a swamp. This is a huge surprise that no one told you about. You don't like the situation. It's not how you imagined your visit. Um, and to get to the castle, you have to go through the swamp. It's going to be messy. It's going to take longer than you expected. You might be sweaty by the, the, by the time you get there. You might be covered in mud. Um, and you have a choice. You have a choice to go through the mud to get to that castle that you wanted to see, um, you know, to maybe go the path that uh, is not what you expected and not exactly what you want to be doing, or to turn around and um, to choose not to visit that castle. And so I think a little bit of what you were talking about earlier in terms of using AIDS can be like this idea of the swamp is that, um, it's not always what we want to do, and it's not always how we pictured it, and it's um, certainly not a choice that we would make for ourselves um, in different circumstances, um, but maybe ultimately it will get us to the goal that we're looking for. Um, and so I, I want to speak to some of the different techniques that I um, I teach people when we're dealing with these unwanted emotions. And many of these techniques kind of fall under the category of staying in the present moment or bringing yourself back to the present moment. As many times when we experience these emotions, we're either living in the future or in the past. We're either reviewing what our lives used to be like when we didn't have MS. We're thinking about um, what our lives could have been if we didn't have MS. Um, we're thinking about um, that, uh, you know, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. And so there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear that can be attached to that. And so um, living in the future and the past can bring up um, a lot of unwanted emotions. So I'm going to give um, several op options when you find yourself living in the future or in the past, ways that you can bring yourself back to the present moment to be able um, to sort of reset your mind and be able to um, focus on what's going on right now. One of those things is um, scheduling worry time. Um, so what I mean by that is uh, if I were to tell everyone uh, not to think of a pink elephant, the first thing that's going to pop into your head is a pink elephant. So if we tell ourselves not to think about how frustrating this is or not to think about a living with MS or not to think about whatever it is that's bringing up those frustrations, that's the thing that's going to pop up into our head. And so what we need to do is learn to set those emotions aside or let's set those thoughts aside rather than tell ourselves not to think those things. 
There's some research that shows that if you schedule time to let yourself go to those places that um, we normally try to suppress, that can help actually reduce your overall um, negative emotions. So I tell a lot of my patients to schedule a half an hour or 20 minutes in the evening or in the morning or a time when you know you're going to have some space and just let your mind go where it's going to go. Um, yell and scream about how frustrating it is. Journal about um, everything that was really upsetting that day. Um, just let yourself be free to feel those um, frustrating emotions. And, um, and then when those emotions come up throughout the day, what we tell ourselves is, these are really important, I need to think about these, but right now is not the time. I'm gonna think about them during my worry time or during my anger time, or during my frustration time, however you wanna label it. But scheduling time to give yourself to let those emotions out can be really helpful. And then um, again, kind of telling yourself throughout the day, I'm gonna think about this during that time, so we're not suppressing them, we're just setting them aside for later. The next thing is um, an, a mindfulness type exercise. Um, which is called five, four, three, two, one. And we can actually all do this right now. So what I want you to do is kind of sit back and um, just take a minute and look around wherever you are and notice or say out loud five things that you see. Um, so for me, that might be a door, a chair, the floor, a window, um, the table. And then think about four things that you hear. Do you hear your chair creaking beneath you? Do you hear my voice? Do you hear um, dogs barking? You know, um, what are four things that you hear? What are three things that you feel? Do you feel your clothes on your body? Do you feel your glasses on your head? Do you feel um, your tongue in your mouth? You know, what are things that you feel? What are two things that you smell? And what is one thing that you taste? And this is a really good exercise that if your mind is running away with you and you don't know um, how to stop it, doing this exercise can give you relief for a little bit. And it may you may even find that if you practice this regularly, that it can give you relief for longer periods of time. Another thing this exercise does is it shows you that you do actually have control of your thoughts and that in the midst of this exercise, you might actually realize that you can change your thoughts and that you can change them to something that's um, uh, more positive or, or more neutral. I wanted to transition now to um, more of a what, what we kind of call a um, a disordered type of emotion, and that's depression. Um, and what I mean by that is that it is it is normal for people with MS to experience depression, but it's it's not a normal uh, uh, emotion that I would expect people to feel every day. It's more extreme than those other emotions that we talked about in terms of grief and frustration and anger. So depression um, is very common in people with MS. Um, approximately um, 25 to 50% of people with MS will experience some form of depression in their lifetime. This is higher than almost any other medical condition, including terminal illnesses. So the more that we learn about it, the more that we know that depression is actually a symptom of MS and not just a reaction to living with a frustrating illness. Um, in um, people with MS, um, ages 18 to 45, there's a 25% chance that um, one will develop a form of depression over the course of one year. So that's kind of one in four people will experience depression over the coming year. Um, it's, uh, as I said, it's more common in people in the general, um, in people with MS than in the general population. And it's more common in people um, with MS than even other uh, long-term medical illnesses and, and people with terminal um, conditions. One way that I distinguish between depression and normal reaction is how much those emotions are impacting the people around you, the things you want to do, and, um, and, and uh, your future goals. So if 
if the people around you are saying, wow, this is really impacting our relationship, the, these continued emotions, or um, this is stopping you from doing the things that you want to do, or this is you don't even feel that you want to do these things anymore, um, then that's a, a, a bigger hint that maybe there's more going on. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie to talk a little bit more. So one of the things that I've noticed in my practice, and, and many of you might have even noticed on your own, um, if you are suffering from depression, that you might start to withdraw from meaningful activities. Um, and and those meaningful activities, it's, it's like the chicken or the egg, like you start to withdraw from these meaningful activities, but then you start to become depressed because you're not engaged in those things that mean a lot to you. Maybe you went to your grandchild's football game every Thursday and that was just something that really brought you joy but you started to become depressed and stopped going to the games and then the depression gets worse because you're missing out on those meaningful things um, or you couldn't make it to the games and you're starting to feel that depression because you're not able to engage in those meaningful activities so there's kind of a, a two-way street on that one um, we also tend to see a decline in self-care people might start showering less they might start eating really unhealthy um, or they might stop taking their medications correctly. Um, you know, it, it's something that can really affect you again both ways. If you're not eating well, you're going to feel worse. It, it's a two-way street again. Um, avoiding social situations and becoming isolated. Again, if, if you're not feeling happy, you might not want to be around the people um, that you were around a lot before, but then becoming isolated is going to make that worse. You may struggle with um, difficulties maintaining habits or routines. Um, you know, maybe every Wednesday you went to exercise with friends and your routines start to become out of order. Um, again, two-way street. And then a lack of confidence and the decreased feeling of self-worth self -worth can happen. And that's, that's really um, a very strong emotion. When, when you don't feel worthy, when you don't feel confident, it can really spiral things in a big way. So not being able to engage in a meaningful activity can really impact you and how your feelings and emotions are and can cause the depression or the depression can cause those. And it's just important to be aware of these things. If you're noticing, hey, I don't spend time with my best friend anymore. I haven't called her in weeks or I haven't been able to go enjoy, um, you know, a, a weekend watching the football games with my nephew. Maybe these are things that you should, if, if you're aware of them, try to engage in them again and try to find ways to participate in those. And we'll have a little here um, scenario so we can kind of talk about it. So Alicia, we have a story of Alicia who has two toddlers and they love going to the park. Recently, she has been struggling because of visual impairments. She can't drive anymore and she has trouble navigating the play areas. So she fears that she's not a good mom. There's that should that Megan was talking about before. I should be able to do this for my kids. I should bring them to the playground. And then feeling like she's not a good mom because she can't bring them to the playground and do their normal routines that they like. So, you know, kind of seeing where she's starting to lose her routines and maybe coming depressed a little bit. And then, uh, Megan, can you go with the mental monologue for us? Yeah, of course. And so I think some other um, typical monologues that we all experience is something called, um, especially in the midst of depression, one of them is called compare and despair. And that is we compare ourselves to other people and we find ourselves lacking. Um, so, you know, if you can, she's comparing herself to the other moms and, and then um, finding herself lacking or thinking that she's not a good mom. And that often leads to feelings of depression. Um, another example of uh, common um, thinking themes that we see in depression is what we call mental filter. And that's um, not noticing, uh, only noticing the things that uh, are, de are depressing or only noticing the things that sort of stick with our hypothesis about what's happening. So, for example, she might uh, notice um, how she's not able to engage uh, like the other moms on the playground, but she's not thinking about or noticing all the ways that she's a great mom, right? That the way that, that she um, can hug her children or how she encourages them um, at home or supports them at school. And so those, there might be many, many ways that she's a good mom, but because she's filtering out those things and only focusing or noticing um, the, the negative, then that also tends to lead um, to more depressed thinking. 
So how can the OT help? So the OT worked with Alicia to help up, come up with some solutions. She actually started the Mommy and Me group on social media. Um, she found a couple pre people in her area to join, met some new friends. Um, she also found a, a good friend of hers who lives nearby who was willing to come pick her and the kids up because they have a child too and they're all going to go together. So they've kind of started a little carpooling program where they ride together. And so Alicia, you know, needed to still feel important, needed to still feel needed or valued. So she is in charge of preparing the fun snacks for the kids. So she's taken on, you know, putting together the apple slices and the peanut butter for everybody. Um, so that gives it gives Alicia a, a role. You know, we still need to find a way that you can continue to find your role and your value and what you can do. It's not saying just have everyone do everything for you. It's sharing the, the load and sharing the work and, and finding what works best for you. We also can educate Alicia on some uh, vision compensation techniques, um, how to adapt environments, um, how to use, you know, uh, her hands more or different tools that can help her out. So though she was initially afraid to mention it to the other mothers and was afraid to talk about her MS and her vision changes, eventually, you know, she built up the courage through all this to be able to communicate it. And the other moms in the group were there to support her. They were helping her. They would bring chairs, uh, the fold up chairs and set them over beside the slide so that they could sit and watch the kids come down the slide because, you know, she couldn't see so well, but she could hear the kids coming down and just enjoy that moment of them giggling and playing so they were able to be closer to the children and the kids could jump up and play with her still. So finding a way that you can still stay engaged is how your OT can really help you maintain your participation and activities that mean a lot to you. Okay, so a lot of times, um, as I sort of alluded to earlier with the mental monologue, depression, um, has a lot to do with what we're thinking about and what's going on in our minds. And so I wanted to start off with a story that I heard in grad school from one of my professors. And so I went to school in um, New York City and one of my professors told this story about our thoughts. So he said, um, I was standing on the platform, the subway platform, and I looked down and I saw a rat running across the subway platform. And he said, I had this kind of crazy thought. I had this thought that I was going to jump off the subway platform, pick up the rat and bite it. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he took a step back and he said, you know, this is a really interesting thing that popped into my mind because it gives me a clue as to what our minds do. Our minds throw us lots of crazy thoughts, right? Lots of um, off the wall thoughts. And the problem is that when those thoughts pop into our head and those thoughts are a little bit closer to the truth or what we perceive to be the truth, we tend to believe them without questioning them. You know, if he really thought that he was going to jump off the subway platform and bite a rat, then he would probably be um, not a psychology professor. He'd probably be going somewhere else. Right. But um, he he didn't believe that thought. He recognized that that was an automatic thought that there was no truth behind. And so we need to start doing that, too, with the thoughts that are a little closer to home and maybe um, sometimes are more believable than something like this. So. Um, many times with depression, what happens is that we talk to ourselves and we, we have negative thoughts about ourselves, other people, and the world. And we have negative predictions about ourselves, our capabilities, the people around us, and what we think is coming in the future. And so many times what we need to do is put those thoughts on trial. What is the evidence for and against that thought? There are maybe many thoughts that people with MS think that are very close to the truth and there's some evidence um, behind them, right? So we might have a thought of something like, I could end up having to use a mobility aid in the future, or I could, um, uh, you know, I, I might, uh, you know, let's think about something outside of MS, um, you know, I might get divorced, Right. We have lots of things that um, we might think about or might pop into our head that could bring us fear or um, uh, or depression. But what's the evidence for and against those thoughts? Um, there might be some evidence that supports the thought of I might have to use a mobility um, aid in the future. But then there might also be some evidence against that thought. 
So um, I don't have to use one right now. Um, or, you know, maybe another thought is if I have to use these aids, then my life will be terrible. And the truth and the research shows us that actually many times when people use these kinds of aids, they actually um, are not more depressed and their life is not terrible. And many people live very full and happy lives using AIDS because it gives them more independence. Um, but so what is the evidence for and against those thoughts? And is the thought that you're having, is that a fact or an opinion? So a fact is something that's really um, that if you you could read it in a journal article, you could read it um, and and um, everybody would agree with that. An opinion is your opinion about that situation. And so when we start to take a step back and look at the evidence for and against thoughts and um, ev and, and look at uh, facts versus opinions, then maybe it brings our thoughts into more of a gray area rather than an all or nothing kind of thought. The other thing that we tend to do is we tend to talk to ourselves in a really negative way, right? So if I were to spill a glass of milk, um, I might say something to myself like, wow, you're such an idiot, right? And that is a terrible way to talk to yourself. And most of us, hopefully all of us, would not talk to a loved one or a friend that way. And so what we want to do is start talking to ourselves the way that we would talk to somebody that we really love and care about. And if we start talking to ourselves the way that we would talk to somebody else, that probably will drastically change your internal monologue and may actually make you feel a lot better. The other thing that happens is that, you know, like that kind of story with the biting the rat, um, our thoughts tend to pop into our heads and then sometimes move on. What um, we we might hang on to those thoughts and they might stick around a lot longer because we are ruminating on them or we're um, chewing them over, or we're keeping them going. But one um, type of t trick you can use is letting thoughts pass. So um, there's lots of different ways to do this, but one is just observing the thoughts that go through your mind, kind of like a leaf on a river. And sort of that leaf is going to flow down the river and eventually um, leave your vision. Or maybe thinking about it like a banner being pulled by a plane. Um, if you ever sat on the beach and watched um, an airplane pull a banner, then you, know, you see it for a while and then eventually it's out of your vision. Another way to think about this is like um, thoughts are like a rain cloud that passes over you. You know, it's it's there for a little while and then eventually it's gone. And it might be pretty terrible while it's right over your head, but eventually it will move on. So kind of thinking about your thoughts and your emotions, um, observing them from with an outside perspective and recognizing that they will eventually pass. Another thing that you can do, especially with depression, is um, sort of uh, come up with your own mantra. And um, one thing that I like to tell people, though, is, is to sort of come up with, uh, recognize what you need it for, um, practice it, and notice how it feels, and then practice, practice, practice. So a mantra is kind of your own sort of pep talk, right? Um, I really hate running. Um, I'm a terrible exerciser. Um, and so if I ever do actually attempt to run, then I am usually every single block saying to myself, okay, one more block, one more block, one more block. That's an example of a mantra. You might say something like, um, I can get through this. I can get through this. I can get through this. Or um, this won't last forever. This won't last forever. And this, this kind of curve is, is showing that we want to be somewhere in the middle. We, you know, if we're too down in the dumps, then we need to use um, kind of our own self-talk to pep ourselves up. Um, if we're too anxious or too over the top, then we need to use our self-talk to bring ourselves down, to kind of bring ourselves somewhere in the middle. And so you might come up with a short phrase that works for you, practice it, say it to yourself, see how it feels. Does it actually make you feel better? If it does, then start using it and see um, if it's helpful in really stressful situations. I wanted to end this depression section with a little bit of a self-test. So this is a validated um, screener for depression. And so um, the first question is, over the past two weeks, have you been bothered by little interest or pleasure in things that you can do? 
So this doesn't mean things that you aren't able to do anymore because of mobility changes, things that you wish that you could do. This is the things that you can do right now and that you like doing. So that might be spending time with family, reading books, um, you know, watching TV. If you just have lost interest in those things, um, then that's what this question is referring to. And then um, the second is feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. So how often have you felt that way over the past two weeks? If you given your score, if you get a score of three or more, then that's an indicator that it might be helpful to talk to your uh, neurologist, primary care provider, if you have a mental health provider, um, your occupational therapist, whoever's on your medical team, it might be worth mentioning to them that um, you've noticed these symptoms. Next, we're gonna talk about anxiety, and this is kind of another, what I call disorder, and, and what we mean by disorder is that it's really disruptive to your everyday life. When we think about um, anxiety, um, we think about fight or flight emotions, and they come from um, our parasympathetic system or our sympathetic system. So the parasympathetic symptom um, conserves energy, and that's when we're feeling pretty um, calm and um, stable. When you start to feel anxious, when you start to feel like you're losing control, um, when you start to feel uh, your pupils dilating, your heart racing, your stomach clenching, your sweating, that's your fight or flight system coming on board. And that's when we start to feel symptoms of anxiety. Um, when our heart rate gets above 100 beats per minute, our prefrontal cortex, and our prefrontal cortex is the area of our brain that helps us think clearly, that helps us problem solve, that helps us um, get through difficult situations, goes offline. And we don't want that to happen. I'm sure um, everyone has probably experienced a time when they got into a verbal argument with somebody and later on thought to themselves, oh, I should have said this, I should have said that. Why didn't I think of this in that moment? And usually that's because we've gotten ourselves so heated in that argument that our prefrontal cortex turns off. And so then we're not thinking as clearly as, um, as when we're calm and relaxed. So when your heart rate goes up, your prefrontal cortex turns off and that fight or flight system turns on. And what we want to do is use strategies to turn that um that prefrontal cortex back on and begin thinking more clearly so we can get ourselves out of that fight or flight feeling. A few th facts about anxiety in MS. Anxiety is studied a lot less than depression, which is a shame because it is like depression, um, more common in people with MS than in the general population. It's actually three times more common in people with MS and up to 40% of people who have MS experience anxiety. Um, MS, uh, anxiety is also one of those symptoms that can really exacerbate other things like cognitive dysfunction, especially how fast your brain processes information. So we're going to talk a little again about how now anxiety is linked to participation in meaningful activities. Um, so when there's anxiety happening, you know, you might fear change more because that frontal part of your brain needs to be able to process what's happening, what you're changing, what, what you're going to do. Uh, for me, I really do not like driving in cities. I'm not a fan of driving in cities. I turn on my flight or fight or flight instantly when I get in cities. And my husband always wants to let me drive the rental car when we go places. So now I'm, this is change. I'm in a new car with new buttons and new new things in a new place. And I'm just, I'm a hot mess. You know, my fight or flight is on and I can't even figure out how to turn the car on at times because there, there's just no frontal lobe functioning at that point. Um, so, and, and then we also tend to see that some people become uh, resistant to accept new techniques or devices. You know, your OT might suggest, hey, or your PT might suggest, hey, you know, maybe we should try this mobility device or maybe we should try this adaptive equipment. Um, and there's this fight or flight response where it's this instant thought of, no, this means I'm going to be giving up. This means I'm disabled. Um, and then there's a barrier to being able to accept trying this new thing or, you know, just, just even trying it sometimes is limited then. Um, so 
that's one of those good times to pull in one of those strategies that Megan suggested earlier, maybe the um, slowing down and counting things or something to kind of slow yourself down and see, can I engage in trying this new device? Um, avoiding social activities can result in isolation. So if, if social activities are just too much and they cause that fight or flight response, you might not go to uh, enjoy these activities, but then that isolation can happen again. Um, being in an anxious state and having that fight or flight feeling can actually increase fatigue. We know most people with MS experience fatigue as it is, but if you're in this constant, tense, anxious moment, your, your tone is going to increase, your sleeping is going to de decrease, your pain might increase. Um, all of these things are going to impact your fatigue levels. So being in that anxious state, causing more fatigue can cause more ang anxiety and depression. It's all kind of snowballs together. So if you can catch that anxiety when it starts and try to use one of these techniques that Megan is sharing with you to control or slow or, or improve the anxiety, you're going to see changes later in the day and, and farther on. Um, as I said, muscle tension or tone and, and pain. Um, and then difficulty processing information, like Megan said. Um, I We always learned of it as like the lizard brain, lizard brain turns on. You you turn on your lizard brain when you're anxious. You, you're in survival mode. You know, our, our body was designed to do this. If, if we're being attacked, we need to fight. So we turn off our high level thinking and we turn on this survival mode. Um, and when you're in survival mode, you can't think. I cannot figure out how to turn on the car in the rental in the rental car because I'm so overwhelmed by everything else. I'm trying to just survive the moment sitting in the front seat. Um, so it's just kind of ways that you can see your meaningful activity can be impacted by anxiety as well. So we have Tom. We're going to talk about Tom here. He's an avid cyclist who lost control and strength in his lower body and experiences overheating. For the last few months, Tom has not cycled because of these symptoms and has not socialized with his cycling friends. In addition to decline general health, it, or sorry, in addition, he has declined in his general health and his depression has increased. Tom's been unable to sleep because he is worried and nervous about his lost interest and changes in his identity. He wants to get back into cycling, but he's hesitant to use adaptive equipment. So Megan, can you give us this little mental monologue for, for uh, Tom here? Yeah, so I've alluded to this earlier, um, but uh, what we see with Tom is kind of this all or nothing thinking. So sort of without cycling, my life is over or who am I? That kind of thing. So um, and I think the, this story also highlights um, the very uh, the the inter the link between depression and anxiety is very strong. So sometimes we see people come in and they present as very anxious and sometimes they come in and they present as depressed. And that's because anxiety and depression has a huge overlap. And um, sometimes we just feel defeated and sometimes we feel anxious. Um, and that can come from the same looking at the same situation, just as Tom is. So how can OT help? So the OT Help Fit Tom for an adaptive recumbent bike. Um, it's a three-wheeled bike and it uses upper body control. So now Tom's able to control his bicycle using his upper body. Um, it's lower to the ground. It's more stable. He doesn't have to worry about falling over. Um, and, and he's just more independent now. Um, we also provided him in information on cooling vests and we recommended one that fits under Tom's shirt, allowing him to manage his body temperature on warm days without being too noticeable. They have come up with great, great um, cooling vests that are just really sleek in design and it makes it easier to accept this new change or, or this adapted thing um, that might stand out normally, but he's able to wear it and it's barely noticeable. So Tom's able to get back into cycling and reconnect with his friends, which is really important in managing his moods and being able to engage in these meaningful activities. Yeah. So I'm gonna use a, another little uh, metaphor here and then we're gonna dive into some calming techniques or how to calm yourself down. And I think with all of the things that we've talked about so far, this um, metaphor can be really helpful. So I want to, you, um, you'd imagine your mind like it's a classroom. And in that classroom, there's some 
quote unquote problem students or students that talk back to the teacher or stick gum under the desk or send text messages when the teacher isn't looking, maybe make fun of some of the other students. Then there are quote unquote good students who pay attention, who get good grades, who suck up to the teacher. Um, and then there's some average students who sit at their desks and kind of go relatively unnoticed. So you can kind of think about your thoughts like these good um, problem or kind of average students. And if you can act sort of like the teacher that stands in front of the, um, the classroom and observes all of these thoughts, then you can create some separation and start to notice um, those, those different types of thoughts. And then maybe like the teacher, try to help um, the problem students uh, uh, reduce those unwanted behaviors and maybe you know bring the average students um, up to becoming good and sort of have a little bit more control over uh, what's going on in that classroom or, or your mind. So um, the other thing with anxiety, a lot of the, the kind of the first line, uh, the first line treatment is relaxation techniques or bringing your frontal lobe back online, right? Calming your heart rate, and um, getting yourself out of fight or flight. And so we can do this in a couple of different ways. One really good way is taking a break. So that is um, a lot of times when we get into fight or flight mode, we are not thinking clearly and we need to step away from whatever that situation is. If it's an argument with your spouse or a family member or even at work, taking it, Research shows that it takes about 20 or 30 minutes of you thinking about something else for your, um, your, your frontal lobe to come back online and for your, your body to calm itself. So if you do nothing else, take about a 20 to 30 minute break. And I usually tell people if you're in an argument with a spouse and you've gotten to the point where you're flooded, you're emotionally flooded and, and you're not thinking clearly anymore, it's time to take a break because that conversation is going to be no longer productive. The key is coming back to the conversation when you both feel calm again. The next is something called deep breathing, which I'm sure everybody's heard about. But taking long, slow, deep breaths um, actually makes it impossible to stay in fight or flight mode. So um, what deep breathing does is it reduces our stress hormones, especially one called cortisol. It reduces our heart rate, it reduces our blood pressure. And as a positive, it also increases our core muscle stability. So um, that's a positive from maybe from your PT might have done deep breathing with you. Um, and it can also increase your tolerance of intense exercise. And so that's another positive thing to it that's outside of just your emotional control. So um, we're going to do a little bit of a deep breathing exercise next. And so what I want you to do is pay attention to um, this animation and I'll walk you through it. So when it's green, I want you to take a long, deep breath in and then hold it. And then let it out slowly like you're blowing through a straw. Breathe in. Hold it. Breathe out like you're breathing through a straw. Breathe in, hold it. And this time I want you to say in your mind, calm when you blow out, calm. Breathe in, hold it. Now start to notice if there's any tension in your body. Say the word calm and start to release that tension as you blow out. Hold it. Breathe out. And you can actually find this animation on um, a website called Duff the Psych. It's at the bottom here, which I know um, everyone will get the slides. Um, and this is a really great tool to use um, to practice breathing or, you know, if you just like the, the image to kind of give you a, how to walk through deep breathing. The one thing with deep breathing that I like to tell everybody is that it's really important to practice deep breathing when you're feeling calm and relaxed so that you can use it effectively when you are feeling stressed. So practice it in the shower or when you wake up or when you're going to sleep at night. And then once you really have it down, then you'll be able to use it in stressful situations. 
So like, just like depression, um, here's a little bit of a self-test to be able to see uh, if, if the anxiety you're experiencing is more than just typical responses to everyday events. And so in the past two weeks, have you been bothered by feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge, or not being able to stop or control your worry? And again, if you score a three or more, then it might be helpful to talk to a medical provider um, about your symptoms. All right, so how can we help manage some unwanted emotions? Um, from an OT perspective, now we've got a lot from Megan. She gave us some great ideas. Um, so here's an OT's perspective, um, kind of on the ideas we've talked about our past scenarios. So we're going to use something called the four P's. And normally I use this in managing fatigue. It's called the four P's, prioritization, positioning, pacing, and planning. And when I talk about it in just fatigue, I leave out some of the mood information, but I'm going to include how it affects your mood throughout this presentation as well. So let's talk about prioritization. Um, it's really important for people to realize that you, so MS gives you a dollar a day. You have this amount of energy to spend on something. And each activity costs an extensive amount of money maybe. Um, maybe taking a shower costs 50 cents because the whole morning routine is just exhausting. Um, so we kind of go through here and figure out how can we manage these activities to make them a little less expensive. So um, prioritization is evaluating your standards. What is necessary and what is sufficient? Um, how can you still include meaningful activities into your day? And I like to call it your soul food. Like what feeds your soul? You know, if it's playing with your grandkids, if it's taking your kids to the park, if it's walking your dog, um, figure out how to balance those things in and fit those into your priorities and not just spend all of your time doing things like working and vacuuming and cleaning and folding laundry. You know, maybe one day it's okay to just set the laundry aside and say, hey, I'm going to walk the dog today. It's a priority when it comes to managing my mood. Um, so in also engaging in um, your health, you know, exercise and healthy eating, things like that, um, spiritual growth, um, you know, things that might be important to you and help you feel better. But the biggest thing that I find a lot of people struggle with is learning how to say no. And I know this is something myself I struggled with for the longest time. Um, but you have to put your mock oxygen mask on first. That's what they say when you're in the airplane, right? Put it on yourself first. You can't help anyone else if you're suffocating. Um, so learn how to say no. It's okay to say no. I think most people will understand. You can say it in the right way so that it's not offensive or, or hurting any feelings. But it's really important to be able to prioritize and say, you know what, I can't help uh, with that activity today because I need to take care of myself today. And then we have pacing. So doing your activities at a pace that helps you be successful. Um, many little adjustments throughout the day can help you um, not feel the anxiety and the, the worry of a huge to-do list. So simplifying your tasks, um, maybe wearing clothing that's easier to put on in the morning so your morning routine is a little less uh, fatiguing. Um, purchasing pre-cut vegetables. You can buy your butternut squash already cut up into chunks and save some energy. Use slow cookers or um, break, break activities into small steps. Remember to take rest breaks. Um, a lot of people wait until they go and go and go and they keep chugging along until they crash. That's actually the worst thing to do when you have MS. Getting your rest break in before or that happens is going to help you maintain a longer function throughout the day. And if you can lay down when you're resting, that's great. Um, but if just a seated rest break is all you can do, that's also helpful. That crash and that, that just draining feeling can cause more anxiety of, I'm not going to get this done. I'm not going to get that done. I have so many things left over. An example I like to use is after you take your shower in the morning, maybe you put on a robe instead of getting fully dressed and doing the rest of your routine, and you just sit down and eat breakfast. And then after you've eaten breakfast and kind of had a little bit of a rest break there, then you can get back into the bathroom and do your hair or shave or do your makeup, something like that. You're just kind of breaking it down and, and pacing it a little bit. Break large tasks into smaller parts. So the little example up here of washing the laundry is a must, drying the laundry is uh, understandable, but putting it away is simply just too far. Um, maybe breaking it up where you wash and you will put it in the dryer maybe in the evening before bed, and then when you wake up in the morning, you'll fold it and hang it. So just kind of breaking activities down can help you pace your 
energy levels and reduce the anxiety of feeling you have to cram everything in. Planning, so it kind of goes with prioritization, prioritization and pacing, but planning, using your calendars to schedule things. If you know that you have a neuro appointment on Thursday and you have to drive two hours to get there and it's going to be a full day of assessments the whole time, you know that's going to be an exhausting day. So maybe on Wednesday, the day before, you're going to make it a light day. So you're planning ahead for what you are expecting to do. By doing that, you're going to help manage your anxiety of that worry. Am I going to be able to to survive the whole day at the appointment. Um, and, and it makes it, um, when you look at it on the calendar, a little easier to feel like this is manageable. I don't have to worry so much. Um, mix in those needs and those wants into your schedule. If you look at that schedule and it's just covered with things you hate to do, odds are you're gonna start to feel depressed. If you're not doing things that are your soul food, you're gonna have a hard time feeling happy or being enjoying what you're doing. So make sure you're sprinkling in those, those soul food in your schedule. Uh, like we said, balance out the heavy and light activities throughout the day. Um, plan those rest breaks. I highly recommend, please, if you use a calendar, schedule yourself rest breaks. Put them in there. Even if you can only rest for five or 10 minutes, please put them in there and start holding yourself accountable to taking rest breaks. Um, increase your self-awareness of your mood at certain times of the day or certain activities. So you might notice, you know what, at the end of the day, around seven o'clock, I start to get a little bit cranky and I think I'm noticing it's because I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I can't function as well when I'm that tired. I can't think. I start to get a little bit of that fight or flight. I get a little agitated maybe with my husband when I get home in the evening and I've had a long day at work and I'm tired. So when you're aware of those, those things, you might be able to, you know, schedule out certain activities that are maybe a little more challenging earlier in the day when you are a little more tolerable of those activities. And identify those signs and signals of your fatigue. Those can lead to your frustration, depression, anxiety, um, grief, anger, all those things can kind of come in when you're um, feeling fatigued. So start to notice those signs before the fatigue happens. And reach out to others. That's the biggest thing that I think is a challenge for people is asking for help. Um, a lot of times people want to help. So accept the help. I mean, how many times have you offered someone and said, hey, can I cook you dinner after something horrible happened to somebody or something stressful is going on? And you meant it. When people offer you help, usually they mean it and they want to be there for you. And I'm pretty sure I felt it myself a million times when somebody actually accepted my help. It made me feel good. I felt happy to help them. So accepting that help is is a nice way to, you know, allow them to feel supportive of you and for you to be able to improve your mood and your activity level. So another thing is positioning. So being able to position yourself in a way that makes you perform your tasks optimally. Um, so creating optimal workstations, for example, um, keeping frequently used items on the countertop where you reach easily, um, having a printer close by instead of walking across the office, um, using special utensils or adapted keyboards, things like that to make your, your day function better. Um, you know, it's frustrating when you have to get up 17 times to get to the printer and whatever you tried to print didn't even print. And then you're coming back and you're going back. So making it close and work better for you is helpful. Ergonomic chairs are great. Um, keeping kitchen supplies where you can reach them easily. Anytime you have the chance to sit, I highly recommend sitting for activities to conserve energy. I'm not saying don't exercise. You still need to exercise and move. But if you're doing a challenging activity or if you're spending a long amount of time um, showering, sitting down is going to conserve that energy and be able to give you more function throughout the day so that you can participate in those meaningful activities. Rolling carts are a good example of conserving energy, putting items on there to roll them around um, in the kitchen, such as like pots and pans or a bowl of soup. Um, and then there's tools that you can use to help with uh, conserving energy as well, like reachers. Instead of climbing on the countertop to pull things out of the top cabinet, get a reacher and maybe you can get things down better. Um, adaptive equipment to put on your clothing, uh, adapted utensils for feeding, uh, make your bed the right height, 
Ways you can conserve energy allow you to be able to engage in meaningful activities. All right. So um, our, our kind of last slide here is to take a, a think back over all of the things that we've discussed and maybe pick one or two techniques that stood out to you as potentially helpful and try to practice those one or two techniques for the next two weeks. If those techniques are not helpful to you, then try something else that was in the um, presentation. And maybe one of the things that we talked about will, will really um, help you manage your moods a little bit better. So adopt the things that are helpful to you and um, ignore the rest. And now we're gonna move to questions and answers. All right, thank you so much, Megan and Stephanie, uh, for all your work on this presentation and uh, so many cool techniques that I think we all can use to, to manage some of these different, uh, different emotions and different moods in our daily lives. Um, which I think uh, is a good place to start with our question and answer. Uh, thank you for everyone for, for sending in those questions. Uh, we have a few minutes here, and if we don't get to your question, I will let you know about uh, other opportunities to, to send questions. Um, but so many of these emotions um, happen in our daily lives, and uh, a lot of our writers have mentioned that uh, whether it's aging or it's menopause, there's just a lot of different things contributing to these new moods and these new new emotions. Um, so the question is, is how do people know, um, how can they identify if their mood changes are caused by MS or caused by something else? So um, sometimes, I mean, one thing I usually start with, I, I'm traditionally or uh, trained as a health psychologist. And so the first thing I tell people is always start with your medical provider, like a physician, and make sure there's no health conditions that are going on that can be modified. So a lot of times medications or um, things like menopause or the, all of those things can cause mood changes. Hormone changes can cause um, changes in your mood. So start with your medical provider and, and um, let them know what's going on and see if there's anything that they can fix. Then um, it's, you know, potentially working with a mental health provider on the behavioral strategies. So ultimately, when you get to somebody like myself or, or other mental health provider, the techniques that we use um, are universal, no matter what the underlying cause is. So even with MS, um, even though we know that um, depression and anxiety and those kinds of things, things are more common, likely in the, in the face of uh, inflammation or other kinds of brain changes, we found that behavioral interventions like uh, changing your thoughts or using um, more behavioral activation actually changes your brain as well. So it really doesn't, um, it doesn't, to, to us, um, all of the techniques work regardless of whether it's due to aging, menopause, MS, et cetera. But like I said, always start with your medical provider and see if there's modifi modifiable health conditions that uh, might improve your mood first. So the solution is, is oftentimes more important than the causes. Um, excellent. Um, another very common question that we received was about communication. Um, a lot of these are invisible symptoms um, that's really hard to, to, to talk to, to others about. So uh, kind of a two-part question. Um, any tips for communicating about, um, about new moods or changing moods? Uh, specifically at work uh, to employers and coworkers, and then also at home, uh, specifically uh, with kids. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, I think that's a, a, a tough question because it sort of depends a little bit in, on your environment in terms of, you know, employers and, and coworkers and things like that. But um, one thing that I usually like to tell people, and especially at home working with families, is um, learning to be vulnerable and share what the soft emotion is um, can sometimes be a really powerful experience. So um, if we yell at our spouse, um, as you were talking about, Stephanie, you know, when you get home um, because you're so exhausted, Later on, being able to share with them, you know, what was really going on for me was that I was feeling really exhausted and I was feeling 
um, scared about what that means in terms of my MS and how it's impacting. Um, and so when you can share those soft emotions, a lot of times that's really powerful. And then you can have a really um, good conversation with them about what is going on and, and get to the root of the issue. Another little um, activity that I liked we did at one of our can-dos was um, somebody had uh, taught us to use um, green, yellow, and red, like a stop mm -hmm. sign, and put it on the refrigerator or somewhere where everybody sees it. And maybe if you're not in a mood where you can tolerate talking or questions or anything, you put the red sign up. This is probably best for home, maybe not for work. Um, and then um, a yellow sign if it's like, you know, I'm a little stressed, but if you need me, let me know. And then a green sign if it's, hey, come straight to me and I'm fine. I really love that little uh, strategy. That's a great idea. Um, you know, similarly, as we talk about communication, kind of on the, the opposite perspective is we have a, a number of support partners uh, on the webinar, uh, many spouses and family members uh, who often feel at a loss, like they're getting this this verbal attack out of nowhere, and they just don't know how to to deal with it or respond to it. Um, any uh, any tips for uh, those support partners that are that are kind of going along on on this journey, um, and how they can identify and manage uh, some of these these changing moods? Yeah, so I think one of the first things um, to practice is not reacting um, to the attack, and so uh, a lot of times. <coughs> If we can think about or try to identify, even if that person is is um, emoting at you in anger, um, try to see beyond the anger and see what's behind it. You you probably know your significant other, your spouse, your partner, your family member pretty well, and and know that there might be some fear or frustration behind that anger. And then um, instead of reacting to the attack, sort of noticing and acknowledging what's going on. So it seems like you're really frustrated right now. What can I do to help? Those kinds of things um, may be a good place to start. If you get to the point where you're trying to do those things and it's not working, then it might be helpful to talk to um, a therapist or a counselor um, just to, to um, help with communication strategies. Excellent. Uh, so we talked a lot about uh, environment, um, and so we've had a few people that have noticed that uh, loud noises and loud talking, that's sort of the trigger um, that leads to their moods changing and, and some rage and some irritability. Um, is there some science behind why, why loud noises may be that trigger, and do you have any suggestions on um, how to modify that environment um, to... to um, kind of heed that off at the at the point before it becomes a trigger? I wonder, I, I don't know if there's a specific science to it, do you, Megan? Um, kind of just logically thinking through it as a sensory standpoint, when we do become overstimulated in general, um, you know, if, if our environment is very busy, uh, for me, I get overstimulated in that rental car. Um, it's just a lot going on. There's new buttons, there's new things. Um, we tend to go into that fight or flight. And I think, um, Oh, we lost her. I think we lost Stephanie there, but um, <coughs> Megan, do you have any suggestions on kind of dealing with, with triggers? Um, another trigger that, that someone mentioned was, was temperature sensitivity. Um, any, oh. any ideas on sort of uh, how to manage your environment um, uh, to, to help manage your moods? You guys can see me now, right? Yes. Okay. I don't know what happened there. Um, I caught the end of that. I think you were talking about temperature regulation and managing moods. Yeah, temperature was also a common trigger okay. for people. So, um, so any other thoughts on, on environmental management? Yeah. Um, in work environments, I highly recommend just a little USB fan that you can plug into your laptop or your, or your computer just to have continuous airflow. Cooling vests. I can't recommend cooling vests enough. Looking into the right cooling vest for you um, is, is critical. Finding the right clothing, watching what materials you're wearing, um, the cuts that you're wearing. You know, even your underclothing can impact how hot you feel. Um, and if you need to in your work environment, discuss it with your employer. Sometimes that's something that they can, you know, accommodate for too, is lowering the temperature in the work environment. 
Excellent. Well, thank you uh, both Megan and Stephanie for all those great suggestions and techniques. Um, thank you for everyone for joining us this evening um, and for all your great questions. Uh, we hope uh, you found tonight to be, be informative. Unfortunately, we've run out of time here, but I do want to let you know about some other opportunities if we didn't get to your question. On our website, which is cando-ms.org, uh, there's a number of different resources and programs. Um, under the resource tab, you'll see Ask the Can Do Team. So if we didn't get you to your question tonight, you can submit that online and we'll pass it on to one of our uh, programs consultants and try to get you an answer to those questions. Um, also on our website, all of our webinars are archived um, and searchable so you can uh, view tonight's webinar or, or any of the other ones that we've created uh, along with uh, the library articles that uh, that go along with it. Uh, so a lot of great information online um, along with our different programs, uh, including our webinars. We also do in-person programs all over the country. Um, so we hope you can continue your, your journey to, to learn and find new techniques to, to thrive and live better with MS um, on our website, which is cando-ms.org. Uh, also, on our website, you'll learn uh, about some special things we have going on, including uh, Can Do Month, uh, which is here. Uh, September's Can Do Month, where we raise awareness for MS through empowerment. Uh, this year, we want to see how you kick MS. You can share images or videos of how you thrive. That could be uh, anything from running to painting to traveling, any way that you kick MS. Um, so you can uh, participate online. Um, there's a number of different ways, um, and we're going to pick a winner uh, every day for, with a special prize. Uh, so please let us know how you kick MS and celebrate Can Do Month uh, with us. Also uh, on, on the Can Do MS website uh, is our peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, um, and so we can continue to provide these uh, educational programs at no, no cost. Um, so there's lots of different ways. It's very easy to get started, um, to ask gifts for your birthday, a uh, bake sale, a walk, a run, anything goes. So there's a number of different ways that you can uh, be active and involved in Can Do MS and ensure that we can continue to put on uh, free programs and resources. Um, there's also uh, different ways you can donate directly to our webinar series here. Um, and again, you're going to receive a PDF copy of these slides. You can click on those links. Uh, right there. Um, so please uh, give if you can, and also please complete uh, our surveys that we're going to send to you here in a minute. That's the really the only way that we can know what's helpful, what, uh, what you wish that we uh, discussed in these programs. Um, so again, you're going to receive a survey here in just a minute. A couple more resources I want to let you know about. Uh, we have uh, MS Path to Care, uh, which is uh, something that Can Do MS help create. Um, it's a number of different practical resources about shared decision making and how to use uh, healthcare professionals like like Stephanie and Megan and, and other team members um, to direct your path to living uh, the best life possible and uh, navigate all the healthcare resources um, and, and really about shared decision making. Um, and so please visit mspathtocare.com. And then also our partner here is, our, is the National MS Society, and they have uh, a wonderful library of resources that we encourage you to, to utilize at nationalmssociety.org, um, as well as their MS Navigator program. Um, so if you need to find local resources, if you're looking for a psychologist or an occupational therapist that specializes in MS, um, they're really the best people on the ground to provide those local resources for you. So again, nationalmssociety.org. And then finally, um, we really encourage you to participate uh, in our webinar series now that you are registered. Uh, you register once and you're good for the rest of the year. Um, and we have a lot of exciting topics to finish up the year. So uh, next month, we're going to talk about mobility and mobility options. Uh, so again, you're automatically registered, but please join us um, on October 7th. And please note that uh, we're going to do this webinar on uh, Monday. We usually do it on the second Tuesday of each month, but October 8th is Yom Kippur. And so we, uh, we encourage uh, everyone to, to join us in on a special Monday webinar, October 7th, on mobility and mobility options. So uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you for uh, filling out your survey that you're going to receive here in a minute. And again, thank you, Megan and Stephanie, for all your time. And, a commitment to Can Do MS. Uh, any any closing words from our esteemed panel? Don't think so. Don't think so. You guys can do it. Just keep an eye on your environment and see and pay attention to your changes. 
All righty. Well, again, thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful evening.